I think the low hanging fruit of this movement of the dam removal movement, which is now global, are these smaller sort of second order rivers and streams that have in the, certainly in the case of the Eastern United States been much abused. And up and down the Eastern seaboard, there's quite a story that's evolving where uh, streams and rivers that were dammed for grist mills sometimes as long as 300 years ago are being freed and the response from all manner of creatures from fish to, to people is has been remarkable. Welcome everyone to this 24th webinar in the series Life Saves the Planet, co-hosted by Biodiversity for a Livable Climate and the WGBH Forum Network. We're presenting this particular webinar to announce the publication of a very important book titled Cracked, The Future of Dams in a Hot Chaotic World, which will be available everywhere on May 2nd and available at patagonia.com a few weeks before that. Cracked can actually be pre-ordered from your local bookstore, but today you're going to be hearing directly from the book's author, Steve Hawley, and from David James Duncan, who wrote the foreword. They and today's moderator, Beth Lambert, will explore the ramifications of the extraordinary dam building boom of the last century and the impact it has had on biodiversity loss, heat buildup, and aridification of the land. Steve is a writer and filmmaker from Hood River, Oregon. His first book, Recovering a Lost River, examined the then emerging science and the activism around dam removal in the United States. In 2019, he co-produced Damned to Extinction, a documentary about the plight of salmon-eating killerwadles who ply the waters of the Pacific off the coast of Washington State. David is an American novelist, essayist, and activist, best known for his two best-selling novels, The River Y and The Brother K. Both novels received the Pacific Northwest Booksellers Award, and The Brothers K was a New York Times notable book in 1992. He's also author of a short story collection, a memoir of sorts, and some churchless sermons. <laughs> Beth Lambert, our moderator, is the director of the Massachusetts Division of Ecological Restoration, part of the Massachusetts Department of Fish and Wildlife, Fish and Game. She oversees a 30-person agency whose mission is to restore and protect rivers, wetlands, and watersheds for the benefits of people, the environment, and uh, ultimately, let me add, for climate. Over the past 15 years, the division has removed 60 dams in partnership with federal, state, municipal, and NGO organizations. Beth has 20 years of experience with river and watershed restoration in Oregon, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts. I want to add that this event is happening in March because March has included World Water Day on March 22nd and also the United Nations first conference focused on water in 47 years that happened on between March 22nd and 24th in New York. So water should be on everyone's mind. It is a critical factor in regulating climate much more so than is commonly known. The science is now there, but not recognized. Um, although this UN conference may have put it forth. So on with the program and thank you for all for coming and thank you to our speakers. Thanks, Paula. I thought a good way to start would be to start locally. Um, WGBH is, of course, a Boston area radio station, and even though our audience is national and even international, it's not often that a community gets to celebrate what they've accomplished with their local streams in such a forum. So 
I think the low hanging fruit of this movement of the dam removal movement, which is now global, are these smaller sort of second order rivers and streams that have in the, certainly in the case of the Eastern United States been much abused. And up and down the Eastern seaboard, there's quite a story that's evolving where uh, streams and rivers that were dammed for grist mills sometimes as long as 300 years ago are being freed. And the response from all manner of creatures from fish to, to people is has been remarkable. So let's celebrate uh, some Massachusetts streams that have been brought back to life. I wanna start by talking about uh, the Mill River. The interesting thing about the mill is that it was declared dead by biologists in 1921. They said it's too polluted, it's not worth trying to save. Um, as time went on, there were some problems with flooding and an outfit called the Mill River Restoration Partnership started working on uh, bringing Mill River back from the dead. And uh, sort of the, maybe the capstone of this project was in 2018, an 85 foot long uh, dam, the West Britannica Dam was removed and the fish responded in kind. In 2020, there were 13,000 river herring that swam up the mill. And that recovery has continued. Beth, our moderator, just told me before we started. The mill, river uh, the, the mill has 30,000 river herring coming up it, uh, every year now. And also in Massachusetts, the town Brook uh, has undergone a similar restoration. They've taken out five dams. And uh, the Housatonic as well has been brought back from you know, the edge of, of death, I suppose. When I read about these East Coast rivers, what I think about is a conversation that I had with a biologist back in 2009. His name is Nate Gray. And Nate showed me the Kennebec River around where Edwards Dam had sat since the 1830s. And it was a remarkable evening walk. We watched short-nosed sturgeon flipping around in the river. And it was that time, that magic hour of the evening when people that love rivers start to talk about what causes them to love these types of places. And Nate told me that when they took out the Edwards Dam, that church bells rang throughout uh, Augusta and that he always thinks about that because when the river came back to life, when you had, we went from thousands of river herring in on the Kennebec system to millions. He said, when that dam came down, he could hear the river breathe again. So there's this sort of reincarnation aspect to, to river restoration that dam removal seems to uh, highlight and even accelerate. And I think it's important to, to remember those church bells ringing because why do we ring church bells? When something good, something soul stirring, something heartwarming, something holy happens, that, when, that is when we ring church bells. And I wanna come back to that thought, um, but right now I wanna sort of shift to why I think that this good work that's been done on all these smaller and much abused streams in the East that work needs to be transferred to bigger river systems, some of which are in my part of the world in the West. I think uh, should our species happen to get through climate chaos and the history of it is written, one of the chapters will talk about the extremely unfortunate timing of 20th century dam building frenzy. So you had from 1930 to roughly 1980, 90,000 large dams that were built on the American landscape, a lot of them in the West. And those dams will, history will tell the story of how they had a really short lifespan. Uh, some of which, even without climate change, we already know the reasons why. Uh, the destruction of habitat, the loss of a migratory corridor, the concentration of heat and pollution but now with climate change, I can think of three reasons why large dam removal needs to be a priority for our federal and state governments and uh, sort of 
the catalyst for a change about the way maybe we think about the West in general. Three things. The first is evaporation loss. When these dams were built, they, the standard sort of cost in evaporation for building a large project was that you lose 10% of the water. Well, that's not true. Uh, research is showing that as particularly as uh, climate change accelerates that we're losing up to 20%. So you look at the cost of that evaporation and uh, you know, certainly water costs money, farmers can tell you that. There was a transaction that happened on the Colorado Basin where the city of Los Angeles acquired some more water rights and some insightful number cruncher took the price per unit per acre foot that Los Angeles paid for that water and multiplied it by the known amount of evaporation that has come out of just one project, uh, Glen Canyon Dam on the Colorado. And the cost of those billowy clouds of Colorado River water came to $9 billion. And so when you look at a system that loses more water to evaporation than any other use except agriculture. It exceeds industrial and municipal use. You're looking at a, at a way of doing things that is absolutely gonna have to change. We can't keep doing it that way. You can't lose 20% of the water in a reservoir year after year. And some of you may have seen the articles in, in the national press about what's happening at Glen Canyon where the reservoir is less than one third full. They're gonna get a reprieve this year because we've had a absolute toad choker of a, of a wet winter. So, but that sort of brings us to the next point, sedimentation. Anymore, when you get a big water year, you're not moving just water, you're moving accumulated sand and silt. And so the other problem that you have at a project like Glen Canyon is the reservoir is literally filling up with mud. And there used to be five marinas where you could put in a boat at Glen Canyon and now there's two. And the upstream most ones have not only dried out, but the reservoir is actually filled in from sediment deposition. Uh, and the last one, the third reason why large dam construction needs to be accelerated is methane emissions. Uh, there's a group of researchers uh, that are kind of global in nature, but they're, one lives uh, figuratively right up the street from me here, he's, he's on the, Washington State University uh, campus in Vancouver. Uh, Dr. John Harrison is his name, and they've just published a paper in the last year that estimates that the methane emissions from the world's reservoirs is equal to the greenhouse gas emissions of the nation of Germany. So that would make reservoirs on planet Earth the sixth largest emitter of greenhouse gas equivalent on the planet. And again, methane is a much more potent greenhouse gas than CO2. The recent COP27 conference, they came to a big agreement on, on capping methane emissions and, and large dam removal would be one way to accomplish that goal. And the last part, I wanna to return to those church bells ringing before I turn things over to my friend, David. Um, in 2017, uh, down in New Zealand, where we have at least one listener uh, on this show today, the Wanganui Iwi won a landmark court case. And the case that they made was that rivers are people too. So in the United States, we're familiar with the legal concept of corporate personhood. And the Wanganui Iwi said, hey, this river, the Wanganui, is as much a part of our culture and our spiritual beliefs and our economy as any corporation. And so we would like it to have the same rights legally that certainly any company deserves, and they won. And I th think that case, if you wanted to look it up, uh, is a perfect illustration of the intersection of environmental and human rights. We're living in an age where the sacrifices that indigenous people have made so that we could sort of at a breakneck pace develop our techno-industrial culture, these sacrifices are becoming known and rightfully so, uh, governments and activists and other people are trying to do right to fix that. 
And so with the Wanganui Iwi in mind, I want to talk a little bit about my home watershed, the Columbia, which was until recently the largest producer of Chinook salmon any place on the planet. And it was thoroughly plugged by uh, 31 federal dams that turned it into from uh, one of the world's largest salmon producing river systems into one of the world's largest hydroelectric uh, producing river systems. A bunch of us have been working for a long time now to try to strike a balance between producing power and producing another type of energy, which is this fish that brings ocean derived nutrients all the way up to the spine of the continent, all the way up to the continental divide. So this is a marine ecosystem, a jewel of planet earth that once stretched from the continental divide out to the continental shelf. And it, among its other many accomplishments, gave rise to uh, hundreds of indigenous cultures that made salmon the center of their cultural and religious and economic lives. And right now, uh, to skip over a whole bunch of struggles that uh, these indigenous people have been engaged in for more than a century, they're sitting down with the Biden administration and they're trying to strike this balance. They're trying to take out four big dams on the Columbia's largest tributary, the Snake, which was, the it produced more salmon almost than the main stem Columbia did. Millions of fish came out of this these wilderness rivers. And my friend David will talk a little bit more about this in a minute. But it's an exciting time for the Columbia and for the Snake and for the indigenous tribes of the Pacific Northwest because I think they've come together in an unprecedented way to try to show the rest of us kind of about the magic and even the sacredness of, of our river systems. And uh, I am hoping mightily that church bells from Lewiston to Astoria will be ringing loud and clear at some point in the next few years. And uh, at the before the show's over, we'll furnish folks a link that they can send in their own comments to the Biden administration. They're trying to make a decision about this issue over the next few months. So with that in mind, I'll turn things over to David Duncan. Thank you, David. Yeah, um, I live um, on the Eastern side of the crown of continent um, and in uh, Montana, very close to the edge of, well, I live within 23 miles of as high as salmon can travel. And it's about, it's over 6,000 feet above the Pacific and uh, 650 miles away from it. And um, I moved there 30 years ago. Uh, I am a river junkie and was, I'm just massively in love with these um, high tributaries that still had salmon. When you're fishing, a, a fly fishing a, a stream for a, a fish this big, and all of a sudden you see something in the water swimming gracefully that's the size of a small child, it it really rattles your cage. And um, I just lose all predatory instinct. I'm not interested in catching a 12 inch trout. I just want to watch this miracle that has come 600 miles. And the kind of story that drives me crazy is that I've um, well, I've had a wonderful time taking friends, uh, some from uh, for a couple from Massachusetts actually. Uh, yeah, wonderful musicians, uh, Jeffrey Foucault and Chris Delmhorst and their daughter Hazel. I took them to a pool on one of those high uh, tribs with a wonderful pioneer era name, uh, Kil Col Killed Colt Creek. <laughs> I don't know what that story tells, but anyway, uh, Jeffrey was ready to fish for cutthroat. And as we reached this pool that's to Helen gone, uh, little seven-year-old Hazel was very brave on that walk. It looked like Navy SEALs were in the, in the pool above where Jeffrey was fishing. Lots of them, their heads bobbing up, and it was the backs of massive spring Chinook salmon. And uh, Hazel and her mom, Chris, just sat mesmerized for three hours watching them. They moved through the pools in daisy chains. And if you watch just the shape of their swimming, it, it forms like a long chain of infinity signs. And it just feels like you're seeing something eternal. 
And in the time since Hazel uh, memorialized that experience with these lovely crayon drawings she sent me um, of the Chinook spelled S-H-A Nook. And uh, I've gone back to the pool many times and I have not seen one more, one more summer Chinook salmon. And when that really came screaming home was the year um, that Tahlequah, a Puget Sound orca, gave birth to uh, um, gave birth and the her child basically died in minutes, and um, she. Uh, She took, she took the child in her mouth and began carrying it. And for 17 days, she held it as it was disintegrating. Um, and uh, There's, on my screen, there's hearts pouring up <laughs> from people who are listening who know this story. Um, she, uh, it's, these floating hearts are killing me. On <laughs> <laughs> uh, day nine, her her pods surrounded her, and they would begin holding the the dead infant. And um, I'm here in the house, my daughter's house, and I have a new grandson here, which doesn't help. <clears throat> seven weeks old and anyway uh she carried she carried that for all those days but on day nine when her pod surrounded her and she was given relief by them also holding the disintegrating child uh i went in desperation over the crown of the continent to all those idaho streams and i looked in every pool uh that I, in which I'd ever seen uh, springs, spring and summer Chinook, and I saw none. I looked hard all day long, and when I got back home, I made a terrible mistake. I, um, I looked to see what the news was from Noah, and there was a site where Noah had been recording Tahlequah's cries. And to hear that sound after seeing no salmon, and I, I disintegrated. Um, sorry to tell such a bummer story, but it's just what's happening. We are losing this unbelievable gift, and it's being squandered, and it's also being buried by unbelievable ignorance and lies by political representatives all over uh, the conservative part of the Northwest. And um, it's, it's literally heartbreaking. And uh, that's my little pitch. <laughs> what do you got, Steve? <laughs> I need a little relief here. <laughs> well, I think we're, we could take on some questions. Uh, I made a movie about that subject and uh it also turned me inside out you know um uh i want to uh honor the memory of ken balcom the biologist that studied those puget sound orcas for almost 50 years who passed away here in december and as much as you and i were turned inside out by that i think ken uh, it just not only broke his heart, but kind of broke his soul too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think what Ken learned most of all from those orcas was not to quit because he campaigned hard for, for several years to try to accelerate lower snake river dam removal. And when he couldn't, he bought some property up on the Elwha river where two large dams had come out 
And he, one of the last things he told me, he says, I, I got to be a part of a, of a winning story. So he bought this property and or this his nonprofit, the Center for Whale Research had bought this property and they're, they're still dedicated to using that property to educating, to providing habitat, you know, so to sort of attach this back to the what's happening with dam removal. It can happen on a large scale, it can happen on a small scale, but it has to happen. And, uh, you know, there's a chapter in my book that's kind of a nuts and bolts about how to remove a dam. And the big ones uh, are just more of everything it takes to remove a small one. And it's gonna take longer. And if there's one thing that we can learn from Ken and many others that have been at this for a long, long time is uh, there's no quitting. <laughs> so, and that's why I've chosen to write about this as, as, as a facet of the uh, conservation movement. I think it's new and exciting and it's has the potential to breathe a ton of life into a movement that's absolutely necessary for the future of our species. So with that in mind, Beth, you want to toss out a few questions for us? Yeah. Um, so we've got some sort of nuts and bolts questions about dams and the dams on the Snake River. Um, and then some other questions um, about, you know, rivers and indigenous voices. So let's start with uh, what's What's so special about the four lower dams on the Snake River that you've been talking about? You know, why those as opposed to any of the other dams in the Columbia Basin? Why the focus on removing those four in particular? We live in a time of climate crisis and those four dams create desert slack waters that are deadly to fish unless they're warm water species. And the warm water species are like smallmouth bass and northern pike minnows that devour migrating salmon smolts. When the river was undammed, there was so much current uh, that the smolts would travel from those headwater streams. There's 5,500 miles of pristine spawning streams in the headwaters of the snake that are just being, uh, they're, they're losing all the young that are produced every year to overheated slack water pools where they have to turn around expend energy swimming when the river used to carry them all the way to sea, all the way to the Pacific from 650 miles away. And um, the, um, yeah, well, the, the snake, there's several other crimes besides the predator species that are introduced by the reservoirs. One is that there, in a time of climate change, it's been a couple of years where the adult salmon can't even return uh, to the headwater streams. Uh, they're little, literally sometimes cooking in the river. There was a huge kill a few years ago where so many sockeye salmon died trying to return to the tribes that control the land in the Okanagan, uh, that sturgeon were dying from gorging on moldering sockeye salmon. So it's just another, just, when I tell these stories of heartbreak, I feel like I need to remind us that the heart doesn't just break, it breaks open. And sometimes really beautiful things can come of that. And the great quote about that is Mother Teresa's, may God break my heart so completely that the whole world falls in. So I'm not trying to create despair, I'm trying to do the opposite, but a heart opening kind of break is a positive thing. It can make us in sorrow and grief it can make us wiser and more compassionate and kinder. And in the age, in the age of industrial everything, I mean, I'm in Seattle now and it's, the well, city's roaring, but beautiful right outside where I'm sitting. And um, in that kind of environment, only extreme compassion uh, and, and knowledge of the repercussions of all the technological change we inflict on the wild world can keep any kind of natural wonder coming to us. You know, we're losing birds at a rapid rate. We're, I mean, so many things that are vital to us and to our sense of wonder and to our sense of hope. That's what we're trying to preserve. So that's my little sermon. You want to say something, Steve? Sure. I mean, Mother Teresa, unfortunately, never made it to Idaho. But uh, <laughs> if she did, she might have gone to up in the Sawtooth Mountains to Stanley and seen the, this, what is one of the most amazing salmon nurseries on the planet. And remember, you know, you're 900 miles from the Pacific Ocean. 
And these fish swim, as David mentioned, more than a mile high in elevation, a thousand miles inland. Uh, they spawn, their eggs hatch, and right about this time of year, as the snow starts to melt, these little tiny fish make it all the way back out to, you know, a few of them anyway, make it all the way back out to Astoria. And that is the type of miracle and beauty that I think engenders this sort of compassion that, that David is describing. And, you know, environmentalists have perhaps been guilty of engaging too many statistics, economics, sort of cold logic arguments. And those arguments are really important, but what ought to be driving the bus in my mind are these arguments that David uh, and to a lesser extent me are trying to make here. Those arguments are important. They're on the bus, but they shouldn't be driving the bus. You know, the history of the conservation movement and the environmental mu movement is to get people to react in compassionate ways about the beauty of the planet, including our own species. And, you know, you, you take a project like, you know, the Mill River or in my part of the world, the White Salmon River. I can almost see it if I step out on my back porch here. You know, the, they took out a dam there. There was muck that was 80 feet deep, right? There's no way that a salmon's gonna spawn in mud that's 80 feet deep. A year later, a year later, there was clear, clean spawning gravel and there were fall Chinook spawning in that spot that had been literally choked off to salmon for more than a century. And the same thing's happening with river herring on the East Coast. When, when Nate Gray told me I could hear the river breathe, when people experience what happens when you take out a dam and let a river come back to life, that is the kind of broken open hearted miracle that, you know, Mother Teresa was describing in a different part of the world. But that's a, the crisis that we're facing with climate chaos and everything else. That is exactly the kind of compassion that we need to, if we're going to have a shot at, you know, continuing with the grand human experiment. Thank you. So we've got a, a couple of questions here um, about, about dams and their impacts. Um, can you speak a little bit more about the link between dams and impoundments and methane? Sure. Um, this is a relatively new branch of science, but it's expanded rapidly. And uh, I'm not a scientist, so I'm just parroting what scientists have told me. But essentially, when you get organic material, and, and in every reservoir, there's this constant influx of organic material, sediment, leaves, you know, wood, so when that weed growth, I mean, tons of aquatic weed growth, that's really the right. that is often driven by agricultural pollution, where you have fertilizers that are that are causing massive algal and aquatic plants to bloom. When that organic material decomposes anaerobically, the byproduct is methane. That's kind of the main passage or the pathway, I should say, by which methane is produced, but there are several others. Um, if you, if this branch of science has become, has grown enormously over the past decade. And so if you search methane emissions from reservoirs, you can spend a whole day. <laughs> um, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency has acknowledged that this is a real thing and they're researching it. Universities all over the world are researching it. They used to think it was uh, only significant in tropical reservoirs. Then they found it in boreal forest way up north. And now it is a phenomenon that they're confident is happening at every reservoir at some scale all over the world. Wow. So, you know, a lot of change in the way that we store and deliver water needs to happen really quickly. And, um, I think methane in particular is going to be sort of the, uh, hopefully the nail in the coffin for a lot of large projects that some of which don't even pencil out economically anymore. So um, I'll leave it at that. A question came in um, uh, with the registration regarding other methods for storing water. Are, are there ideas that you can speak to um, on how we can replace the water storage function that some of these large dams provide. 
Sure. I think the most exciting one is aquifer recharge, right? And you think about a place like California, which is, has a lot of super agriculturally intensive practices. And unfortunately in California, they've actually emptied out a lot of groundwater. And what they're finding, particularly with some new uh, technologies related to geology is that you can actually, and, you know, keep in mind that the snowpack in California this year is about probably between 150 and 200% of normal all over the state. So in a year or in a season where you have excess water, it's possible to actually dump water back into these aquifers and start to rebuild them as a place to store water out from the sort of ravages of evaporation. Um, you know, there are other things that can be done. Uh, one thing that's been suggested is to, <laughs> and this doesn't make a lot of sense to me, is to get rid of large reservoirs down in the deserts and build more smaller ones up high in the headwaters. Um, I don't really see that as a viable solution. You know, I think part of it starts not with science, but with politics and particularly in the American West. And I know this is a major issue uh, in the Snake River Basin. Um, the agricultural lobby has a stranglehold on a lot of good things that might otherwise happen. Um, and you know, the, the farm lobby in this country is, has power all out of proportion to uh, the number of people that they represent. Um, and the same, I would say, is true of the hydropower industry. They've done a pretty decent job of making sure that the science around methane emissions doesn't get too far out into the, uh, into the ether. So, you know, that's why forums like this one are so important because, you know, information is exactly what people need. Yeah, I agree with you. What role are indigenous voices playing in the discussion about the Snake River dams and other dams in the West? David, you want to take that one? I don't because uh, if I get anything wrong, my indigenous friends will kill me. <laughs> right. Say, Steve, Steve, you're on the line. You, you, you wrote the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they'll kill me too, but that's all right. Uh, I, I think what I said earlier is important to emphasize. Um, right now in the Pacific Northwest, uh, salmon dependent tribes, which are which is almost every Pacific Northwestern mm -hmm. indigenous nation, have come together in an unprecedented way to try to deliver a win for rivers in this part of the world. And, you know, the reason I made this uh, northern to southern hemisphere connection between what happened in New Zealand and what's happening here is that, uh, again, this intersection of human rights and environmental causes is one that is a really um, potent uh, tool, I guess, politically. I hesitate to call it a tool, a strategy. Um, and it's also for those of us that have a, you know, a conscience, you can see what, again, what indigenous people have sacrificed so that we could, you know, in the matter of a few centuries, create the, the economy and the technology that we have now. And it's time to, I think, give some of that back. I, I, I want to apologize for punting. I'd like to talk a little bit. Go ahead. That. Yeah. The, the people don't know that the tribes didn't just give up uh, their, literally their Eucharist species and the core of their culture is the wild salmon. And it produced more food in this region probably than any other, any other thing that's happened since maybe even wheat. I mean, it's a, the, the abundance of salmon in the Columbia is almost beyond guessing. It was probably somewhere varying from year to year between 30 and 50 million salmon a year. If you go not to the re records made by biologies late in the last century uh, who are getting paid by the federal government, but go to the story records of all the, all the tributaries and streams that had huge runs of much bigger fish. I mean, these fish called June hogs were a hundred pound Chinook salmon that, that migrated up into Canada. Anyway, they're, um, they were given land that wasn't their chosen land 
and they were given treaty rights that allowed them to fish in, perpetu in perpetuity in their usual and accustomed places, as the language goes. And often those places are buried 100 feet deep in water behind a reservoir. Or there was even uh, a, a case in Idaho where it was found. Um, it, an Idaho court actually said that you can fish in your usual and accustomed place here on this river that was in question, but we don't have any obligation to keep water in the river. So you're getting tribes fishing in a dry stream bed uh, while irrigation takes what they were guaranteed by treaty rights. So the ways in which they've been screwed are endless. Their patience and kindness ha has been staggering. Um, I, I spoke to uh, tribes uh, at University of Montana a few years ago when they were redoing, and First Nations people who'd come from all over because they were redoing the, the treaty rights on the Columbia River between the US and Canada. And of course the tribes, it's their sovereign lands. And uh, right before this event, <clears throat> the Trump administration said they wouldn't be sending a representative. Then the Trudeau administration did the same thing. And then all these tribal people still came to this event just to share the knowledge of the good things they've done on their separate reservations with each other. And I've never seen more gracious people um, in something that would have just, uh, I would have just been in an impotent rage. And there was just such kindness. And I also spoke about um, how the, I mean, we have a tradition called the Eucharist in Christianity that's 2000 years old about the body and blood of Christ. They have a tradition in their world where for 11,000 years, wild salmon were the same thing. And to say, uh, well, we can't bring salmon back to all the, all the salmon rivers above Grand Coulee Dam anymore. That era is past. That's like telling Pope Francis or Mother Teresa, well, we don't believe this hocus pope that you eat a cracker and drink a little grape juice and pretend that's Jesus. Come on. And that's just not the way it works. It's uh, this is sacrosanct. And it was also their source of income. Salmon were re replaced with hydro and the tribes were giving, given nothing in return. And I mean, the, the number of ways that they've been battered and still remain so many admirable people in the tribes in the West. So uh, that's, that's my little story. I'm going to add one more thing to that. The, what goes missing a lot of times from a non-Indigenous perspective is how sophisticated some of the tribal strategies, in addition to their patience and kindness, uh, the Nez Perce Nation, the Nimipu, are in the process of coordinating with other Western tribes to build a virtual power plant. And what they're hoping eventually is to put, uh, I think, somebody correct me in the chat if I'm wrong, 5,000 megawatts of renewable energy, mostly in the form of solar, uh, out on reservations networked together to show the slow moving, slow moving, you know, federal government, <laughs> a century uh, worth of slow moving that if they're not gonna replace replace the power that's been, you know, uh, that we might lose from the hydro system, that they're gonna replace it on their own. And uh, if you go, the first step in this process, if you go to Lapway, Idaho, uh, to and wander through town, the first goal right now is to put solar panels on every residence in Lapway and every building in Lapway. And judging by the pace and scale of of their progress, they're gonna they're gonna hit that first benchmark pretty soon. Yes. So that those are all exciting, heartening developments that unfortunately don't make the news as often as they should. We actually have a question about that that just came in. Um, the question is, what should we be saying to our government representatives about how to replace the electricity <laughs> generated by, say, um, the Bonneville Dam or other large dams? Well, what you have here is a case of, you know, Bonneville is an incredibly uh, shrewd and, in my opinion, dishonest uh, entity. 
when do you want to start the clock on replacing that power, right? So there was a law passed in 1980 called uh, the Northwest Power Act, and it set in motion exactly what the answer to that question. Since uh, 2000, I believe there's at least 11,000 megawatts of wind power that's gone in right in the same corridor where most of the dams on the main stem Columbia are. There is a queue for solar and wind projects that has another 20,000 megawatts in it. Uh, conservation, in other words, just efficiency in light bulbs and appliances has furnished another seven or 8,000 megawatts. And so depending on who you talk to, that power has already been replaced a dozen times over at least. Just but, for clarity, the Bonneville was mentioned in a confusing way, like the dam yeah. specifically, and then you start talking about BPA. Sure. Nobody was talking about re removing those four dams that get the salmon to the Snake River. We're talking about the four lower Snake River dams right. that are inexcusably deadly to, to salmon with with no profit that can't, I mean, they're, they're really screwing ratepayers and taxpayers. It, it costs a huge amount of money just to send a, a barge from the fake seaport of Lewiston, and it's the most economically depressed uh, small city in the Northwest. I mean, they've really sacrificed themselves in the belief that uh, something good could come of that. Yeah, and I, I'll pile on what David is saying. I was just talking about thousands and thousands of megawatts that have been either saved or installed in the region over the past 40 years. We're talking about uh, four dams that produce 800 megawatts of electricity and they produce it this time of year when nobody around here needs it. That's how absurd the situation is. So thanks for clarifying, David. So we have a question from Sharon who would like to know, how can we all help? <laughs> well, I don't know where Sharon lives, but I would guess that there's a creek or a river or something nearby. And um, I think, the most uh, soul fortifying thing you can do to take part in this movement is to figure out what's happening on your local creek and try to make it a better place. If, if that's not enough, um, I guess I stop giving activism advice for the same reason I don't give romantic advice. It's very personal and you just don't know, you know what that person actually needs. And so, I think if you really want to see what David and I have been uh, railing about here for the past 40 minutes, again, I would book a trip to the Sawtooth Mountains in Idaho in August and September. And especially in a year like this one where we've had plenty of rain and snow, uh, you can ask any local person where you can go set up your lawn chair and wait for these miraculous creatures to return from the Pacific Ocean it will change your perspective on and your relationship with with what we you know inadequately refer to as nature it's uh it's it's to witness that is to witness a miracle there's no other way to say it and i would say the same thing of, of any species that migrates into fresh water from the salt it's it's a miraculous thing to see Another question that came in is, how do you find the emotional strength to keep fighting for wild salmon and free flowing rivers? Well, I don't. I'm just as liable to, you know, crack up as anybody, as David or anybody else. I mean, this is this movement is really about people, right? Dam removal is about so many, so much of the environmental movement has been about saying no. You know, no to development. It's a save our movement, save our wildflower meadow, you know, save our mountain, save our tree. This is a movement about saying yes to a grander vision of what we mean to be as a species that, you know, uh, we should fulfill the promises that we've made to future generations to leave them something of the once vast garden that we inherited, you know? I'm gonna be shameless. I spent the last 16 years writing a novel called Sun House that is entirely about how, how people can communicate with each other, how they can give up their stereotypes, what's needed. 
uh, what's needed to bring about change. It's and it's getting it's gotten more attention already five months before a publication than all my previous books put together. And um, it can be pre-ordered. And I just hope you're on the lookout for it because um, I have really racked my brain and <laughs> wrung my heart over this thing. This was a very costly 16 years and that I even had 16 years that when my life was stable enough that I could continue this project speaks to the maybe hundreds of people who have helped me during that time. That is that is community uh, being truly idealistic and supporting one of their own when I've tried to support them with my work. And uh, I'm just really moved by the whole thing that's going on with this book. S-U-N house, but the other son house, the blues guy, he's in the book too. So <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of people that are waiting for that to come out and eager to read it as soon as it does, David. Um, so we have a question. This is a Massachusetts question, but it could really be applied to any state or any place with dams, which, as you have pointed out, is the whole world. So the question is, here in Massachusetts, we have over 3,000 dams, the majority of which are obsolete. At the rate we're going, it will take literal, literal centuries to remove the bulk of them. How do we build the momentum necessary to take on a challenge of this scale? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, right now, our our um, that's a tough one. Our, our politics is just American politics is is in crisis. It's uh, there are people with extremely uh, opposed points of view. Um, I just know from experience what it feels like to have to be part of a viable community, um, and um, so that's I have I've done what I could. Uh, I, it, it's this is going to sound like a cliche, but you know, boots on the ground is a is a way to transcend the uh, dysfunctional situation that we find with our you know national politics. Um, these type of projects where you can show your child or grandchild a place and say that this spot is better than it was when I was a kid or w even when I was an adult. We did something good here. Yeah. That builds momentum in a way that press releases and news broadcasts and bad news from your favorite paper absolutely will never do. And uh, I think that we have to just have faith in that process and build on that. That's the only thing we can do, really. But uh, Steve, you mentioned before that New Jersey and Pennsylvania were very advanced in their dam removal. Can you talk at all about what happened in those states? Well, most people in my part of the world anyway don't really think of New Jersey in this way, but New Jersey actually has very strong environmental laws. Um, in my book, uh, I profile uh, some rivers in New Jersey that have just really benefited from um, penalties that have been levied against companies that pollute. And that uh, this this fellow's name in the book is Brian Cowden. And uh, he's a dam buster. And he's figured out a way to leverage sort of different pots of state and federal money to make river systems a better place, you know? It takes all kinds of minds to, to bring a dam down. You know, it takes uh, the extrovert that doesn't mind being pushed in front of a bunch of microphones to speak eloquently. It takes somebody that can sift through stacks and stacks of bureaucratic dead language and paperwork to figure out where those hooks are. It takes somebody like uh, a heavy equipment operator that has a gift for seeing how a stream might be put back together after a dam or some other obstruction is removed. And again, that's why I think this is such an exciting facet of all the social movements that are happening to, around the planet right now. This is a pathway to look at how we live and where we live in a new light. And uh, so, I, you know, it, it gives me uh, a counter a counterweight to all of the 
pessimism that we all sometimes feel that, you know, it's a, it's a community effort to get a dam taken out and that should feel good. Yeah, thank you. So we're coming, I think, to the end of the session here. Um, do either of you have some last thoughts that you would like to share on dams, the Snake River, Colorado River dam removal, or anything else for the audience? I have a little something that could maybe serve as sort of a benediction. Cormac uh, McCarthy has a novel called The Road that ends with a beautiful description of wild brook, brook trout after a post-apocalypse world uh, could no longer sustain them and incredibly poetic. And I just thought if Cormac lived amid the salmon streams of the interior west, the last paragraph of the road might read something like this. I'm gonna break my heart again, but once, <clears throat> once there were wild salmon in these mountains, you could see them standing in the clear currents the edges of their fins trembling in the flow. They were wounded silver, massive, muscular, torsional. They smelled of ocean in your hand. That uncontainable, <clears throat> that uncontainable wildness in every stream. On their sides gleamed maps of the ocean and it's becoming. And on their backs, mazes the way by which they'd come, maps and mazes of things that could not be put back in the high mountain birth houses in which they died, that their kind might live, all things hummed of mysteries older than man. Thank you, David. Steve, do you have any closing words for us? Hey, you want to read that again real quick? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I was That was beautiful. It really was. Uh, and Thank you uh, to WGBH. Thank you for everybody that took the time out of their evening or their afternoon to, to listen to this. And please take, if there's anything that you've heard that's inspiring, uh, sentiment without action is the ruin of the soul. So don't let your soul be ruined. Go fix a creek somewhere. Yeah, you're, you're Thanks very much. I really enjoyed talking with you both. Thanks, Over Beth. to you, Paula. Thanks, Beth. Thanks, Steve and David. Um, yeah, thank you for an incredibly informative and very moving depiction of what has happened with dams in this hot, chaotic world. And uh, yeah, we see a lot of room for people to come into their communities, into their city councils, however small or large the community, and mobilize people to think about the impact, the negative impact of the dams that that are having a particularly negative impact, which is most of them, and um, and find ways to work together as a community. It can be civic science for young people. Helping to work on a dam removal project is an incredibly healthy thing for young people to be doing in a world that they see is in a lot of trouble and that they feel probably a little helpless about doing anything about. So. Yeah, I think this is a, a very important um, lesson about restoring waterways. Ecosystem restoration is what this series is about. And um, we at Biodiversity for Livable Climate are very grateful. Yeah, and moved by what you have presented today. So thanks a lot. Thank you.